Professor Nili Cohen, thank you for the introduction. And the President of the Israeli Academy of Sciences, Dr. Julie Maxton, CEO of Royal Society, members of the Academy's distinguished speaker, ladies and gentlemen. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to open the first session of this joint very important and topical workshop on privacy and technology, which is the first, I understand, of a symposium and a series of workshops on science, technology, and ethics. Very important subject. Our session is entitled, can Informa How Can Information Technology and Privacy Coexist? If you drop the how, it remains, can information technology and science coexist? After the very interesting remarks of Nili and Julie, I would just like to say a few words uh, or concerns, really, about uh, what we are facing. I am not in the IT business. I'm chemical engineer, not electrical engineer, and neither in social sciences. But it seems to me that there is no question that we are at the watershed moment in human history because in just a few years, for the first time in history, every man, woman, and child on this planet will become entangled in a single giant man-made communication system dominated by impersonal IT and social media giant corporation with vague moral and national loyalties roaming the world for, for, for information extracted from all of us uh, without even us noticing it, being oblivious to what's going on. And uh, we are mostly unaware of what, what's happening and the surveillance that is going on on, on, on all of us. It is more benign, perhaps, than Big Brother, but not less thorough. And we'll, we too like the, the and we too, like the protagonist of 1984, searching for love and, and privacy, may end up loving Big Brother. I hope that this exciting session will help us identify the unavoidable points of tension between the IT revolution and privacy, the great challenges ahead, as well as the relationship to other values we certainly wish to protect and pass them on to our children and grandchildren, such as freedom, autonomy, equality, dignity, dignity above all. And now to back to our session. Each speaker will have, as you know, 25 minutes, then there will be a 10 minutes QA, and uh, after two speakers, there will be a 20 minutes break, and at the end of the, end of the workshop, there will be, at the end of the session, there will be time for the speakers to add some remarks, respond, general discussion. So that's our program. Okay? And now I would like to call upon our speakers to come up to the head table, take your seats, and I'll call the first speaker. Ruti and uh, Anthony. And I think we are missing one. It will be just the first two. Oh, he just arrived. Oh, Yossi? Yeah, okay. I understand that Yossi was late because boys misled him. <laughs> and his company owns it. <laughs> Human factor, the driver did not follow instructions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, you, you say, how, you, how do you say your name? Matthias or Matthias? Matthias. Matthias. Okay. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Ruth Gavison. She is the Chaim Cohn Professor Emerita of Human Rights at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and her areas of research include look at this ethnic conflict protection of minorities, human rights, political theory, judiciary law, religion and politics, and Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. Could it be more to the point, your research agenda? 
She has published extensively in Israel and abroad, and her many awards include the Prime Minister Emmet Award and the very prestigious Israel Prize for Legal Research in 2011, and a couple of honorary doctorates from different places. She authored with Rabbi Yaakov Meidan the Gavizon Meidan Covenant on State and Religious Issues Among Jews, which is the most authoritative document of its kind, and which unfortunately was rejected by the ultra-Orthodox leadership in Israel. She was a member of the Vinograd Commission, which investigated the 2006 Lebanon War. And more recently, she was commissioned by the past Minister of Justice, Sipi Livni, the former, not, sorry, Sipi <laughs> Livni, to report on the constitutional <coughs> anchoring of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. And she submitted the recommendation in November 2014 but politics changed and nothing was implemented. Professor Gavison is a founding member and past chairperson and president of the Association of Civil Rights in Israel and the founding president of Metzila, a center of Zionist, Jewish, liberal, and humanist thoughts. Ruth is a clear and powerful voice in a host of matters that plague the Israeli society and when she speaks, everybody listens. <laughs> the title of her lecture is Privacy and Anonymity. I must add to the generous uh, introduction the fact that the main reason I'm here today is the fact that I wrote my doctoral dissertation in Oxford in the early 70s on the legal protection of privacy <laughs> under the supervision of HLA Hart. So uh, uh, for me, uh, coming here to speak about uh, uh, privacy uh, is uh, really closing uh, in an event with the Royal Academy is, is really a closing of an important circle. There is an important puzzle about privacy. There is a lot of talk about privacy and its importance. There are pervasive new forms of loss of privacy that we have heard about. Yet most people and most leaders, cultural, intellectual, political, social, are not very concerned with such losses. This fact limits effective protection and it raises important questions. Here is what I'm going to argue. Privacy is indeed very important. Privacy relates to the most basic forms of human and social flourishing. Full privateness or publicness is neither possible nor desirable. The goal we are seeking when we want to protect privacy is an acceptable <coughs> balance between private and public. Such a balance is a universal and critical aspect of the welfare of individuals and societies from time immemorial. The new technology is a variation on a very old theme. A partial explanation of the puzzle is the fact that the relative anonymity of most individuals leads many of them to undervalue the dangers of losses of privacy to themselves, to other individuals, and to other societies. But we don't usually base our picture of a good life on the sentiments of individuals. They, as well as decision makers and leaders, do not see the picture as a whole. And this is why, in part, they put privacy at risk. Sometimes, very interestingly, they do this in the name of freedom itself. This misconception is very unfortunate and very dangerous. Leaders and elites should put privacy in its broadest context. Seen in this way, the urgency in protecting the balance between private and public becomes apparent. Technology may then be an important tool in protecting privacy, not just a source of new threats to its existence. Okay, so now let me elaborate. Ambiguity about the nature of privacy relates to debates about why it is important and how it relates to other values. The core of the private, I suggest, 
is that of something that is not, is not, or should not be, accessible, is not, or shouldn't be, known, and is not, or shouldn't be, the matter of attention. So my concept of privacy is centered on information, access, knowledge. Access, knowledge, attention are three complex ideas with interesting relations among them, but together they form a core. Many use private, private to signify many other things. For instance, we're talking a lot about the private-public distinction. The private-public <coughs> distinction is all over the place. Some people talk about the private as that which should not be regulated. Abortion, contraception, is a private matter. Some people talk about private markets vis-a-vis -vis government. Some other people say that no, markets are public to the privacy of families. We're talking about public places, public figures. We're talking about many things. I want to reject the invitation to conflate privacy and the private in these many ways. Because I think this conflation explains part of the confusion that is responsible for the difficulty that I'm talking about, the puzzle that I'm talking about. Take liberty, it's very important. The Supreme Court of the United States said that there is a right to privacy, that means that women can have an abortion. They did it because of the complexities of the American legal system and its history. But clearly, the question whether a woman is allowed to have an abortion is not a question of privacy. This is murder under some descriptions. We're not talking about the murder committed in a private place as a matter of privacy. This is murder. Clearly, this should be regulative. This is not something that is private. Now, with contraceptives and maybe with abortion, there may be a relation to privacy. So privacy may be violated if we indeed have a prohibition on using contraceptives and then we use law enforcement mechanism in order to follow couples and see what they do in their bedrooms and this will involve a violation of proper privacy. So this is an argument from privacy to liberty. It doesn't make the use of contraceptive a question of privacy. Same with markets, work, public offices, etc. I think that we gain illumination if we maintain private and privacy in this way, and that this actually illuminates the relationships between privacy and freedom, privacy and dignity, and privacy and other values. If we conflate them, we then lose the ability to see exactly what we are talking about. So the private-public distinction I'm talking about is that relating to accessibility. However, the problem with framing privacy is that it's not put in the broader context of the other values to which it contributes. And I will return to this point in a minute. Private is the residual category of the public and vice versa. Privacy is what facilitates the maintenance of the private. So, when I talk about privacy and private in my sense, this is the context I'm talking about. Clearly, in both the descriptive and the normative systems, is private, should be private, the content and the dividing lines between private and public have been very dynamic across cultures and times and always contested. This is part of what we're talking about. Moreover, when we talk about the protection of privacy, it's important to emphasize that we are not trying to have a world that is private. That Privacy is a value, so more of privacy is always the better. No. What we are trying to achieve is the protection of that privacy that will permit us to achieve and maintain an optimal, or at least an acceptable balance between private and public. Both are critical to the good life. 
In other words, the goal itself involves balancing between the two ideal typical poles of private and public, giving individuals the control over some aspects of their privacy, some definitions of privacy suggest that, is one way out of many of resolving that possible conflict. The presumption in favor of the individual <coughs> as the final arbiter rests on our preference in liberal society in favor of the individual uh, uh, um, uh, for obvious reasons, substantive as well as evidentiary and operational. However, the evaluative discussion of privacy should be independent of the choices of individuals. Consent is neither necessary nor sufficient for making a loss of privacy unacceptable. Okay. Now we can get to business. If this is the conceptual framework, what is an unacceptable balance? Now, some people try to look at legal cases. They look at legal cases. The legal cases are not useful. What comes to court is not very useful. What we need to look at is fictional accounts of absence of privacy, because absence of privacy is what makes the picture clearer. And I want to use two depictions. One is the 1984 that we've already heard about, and the other is the more recent, The Circle, by David Eggers. Okay, I guess I don't have to say much about 1984 in this audience. Uh, uh, um, the differences between the two are important because the circle is in a way more relevant to Western democracies. And the circle is not a state, is not a regime, is not Big Brother, it's a high-tech company that gives its workers a very attractive deal of marvelous working conditions, but the mission of the company is the abolition of privacy. Privacy is theft. People have a right to know everything. So, Winston, the hero, the tragic hero of 1984, and May, the heroine of the circle, are people who experience total loss of privacy. And the picture that is painted in these books is quite terrible. The dystopias are very suggestive. They identify in a chilling way processes involving loss of privacy, which are both in many ways realistic and very troubling to most readers. They illustrate very powerfully how absence of privacy may negate freedom, undermine possible dissent or attempted change, how the denial of privacy is an important and necessary element of totalitarianism, how it undermines intimacy, growth, and autonomy. However, they do not remove the puzzle. In a way, they strengthen it. Okay, so why should we care about privacy? <laughs> the general insight that a good society and a good life depend on some balance between private and public in the broad sense is clearly something that is universal and ancient. It appears in all cultures and in all religions. Individuals are important, central, image of God, whole worlds, but they are social animals, they must live in societies, they must live in families. They cannot but be social creatures. So the private public is imminent. It's more than that. Every society needs conformity, needs traditions, it needs rules, needs continuity and stability. But every society needs adaptation to change. Every society and every individual needs intimacy, growth, an opportunity to learn without ridicule, so that potentially they can go to the public and perform great deeds in the arts or the sciences or in politics. We want to have individuals who have a very strong core of themselves because they are the people who are likely to be the great creators and benefactors and presences in our public life. So this idea that 
privacy is critical is indeed very central to our culture. And we know that a healthy society will create the patterns and the political institutions that will allow and encourage individuals and groups to move on the spectrum between self-fulfillment and public service, between membership and personal advance and all these things. These are our assumptions about the good society. Now these are very general, almost trivial statements. Yet we know that there are periods in the lives of societies and nations in which this balance was seriously flawed. We saw the dystopias and we know that totalitarian regimes do exist. Fortunately, they also fall, but the danger is quite real and it's based on very important and central incentives in individuals and in rulers. This is part of the human condition. In our own time, actually, one of the complexities of privacy that we are seeing is that many people feel that liberal democracies are moving in both directions at the same time, because we have clearly a lot of emphasis on individualism, human rights, freedom, but so much so that we are suspicious, some of us, about the inevitable need for intimacy, groups, communities, and solidarity. We have a lot of economic freedom, we have a lot of growing gaps and people feeling that they are left behind. And we are having a lot of privatization with a lot of delegitimation of some claims for privacy. On the other hand, we talk about democracy, we want freedom of expression, we want accountability, we want transparency. All these things may be tricky with some balance between private and public. And now we have a clash of civilizations with societies in which religion and community are much more powerful. And we have a globalization that increases the fluidity of borderlines of communities. And all of these things create a huge complexity about the way we can and should create balances between private and public. So how is the privacy as I defined it, the narrow privacy, relevant to all of this? The literature is full of many accounts, but I think we should go back to 1984 and the circle, because they are the ones who really illustrate how powerfully the negation of privacy, privacy in the narrow sense, affects everything human and social. And the heroes of our stories are constantly observed, at least potentially. It's not only that they are constantly observed, they are constantly bombarded by immense amounts of information, alerts, likes, uh, whatsapps, whatever, that they need to respond to in real time. They don't have any control about their private space. They don't have much control over who they spend time with. They don't have opportunities for intimacy. And they don't have a legitimacy for wanting to have these things. Now, the bombardment, the constant accessibility to us is something that we know very powerfully from today's technology that is very much there in 1984, but usually people do not think about. And they do not think about it, and this is one of the reasons for the answer to my puzzle. They don't think about it because most people, when they think about the loss of privacy, think about, do they have enough privacy? Now, most people in modern Western society have enough privacy. They have many opportunity for privacy. And they have sometimes more privacy than they can handle. 
And they think that the problem of WhatsApp communications all over the place, <laughs> everything is demanding our attention. They think that this is not a serious problem at all for their life in their balance between private and public because they don't connect it to a social trend. They think this is our problem. It's like dieting. Maybe we're not disciplined enough, but this is personal. We have the power to disconnect. So the fact that this is changing our lives, maybe in not so great ways, is a matter of choice. We cannot complain about it. It's definitely not a reason for going up on barricades. It's true, but this is not the whole story. When people don't understand that we need to look at this picture in a broader context, and we don't see how this new world is affecting our opportunities for growth, for intimacy, for authenticity, for looking hard at questions, for thinking through serious problems, for making plans to maybe do things differently with a group of like-minded people, when we don't have the ability to know who is a like-minded person, when political correctness inhibits us from exploring ideas about current events, when all these things happen, the challenge to the quality of life that we may have and the quality of decisions that we can make is very, very, very serious. There is more. Many people feel that privacy is about them. They don't have much to hide. And OK, so people will know about them. It will be embarrassing. It's not the end of the world. It's not about that at all. Privacy helps criminals and terrorists, and we don't want to do that, and we need to, to not let them use privacy. But that's not the issue. What we give up when we give up privacy in that way is much more than just information about ourselves. It's our way of coping with the challenge of placing ourselves as responsible individuals within a context of family, people, nation, humanity. And we need to put ourselves in that context. So when we and judges and lawyers and legislators when we think about the balance, the acceptable balance, or unacceptable balance between privacy and publicity or publicness, we need to have all of this in mind. We need to think about the context in which we want people to be as blunt as they can and as candid as they can and talk about an issue clearly without thinking how it's going to sound on Facebook today or in 10 years. We want to give them that freedom because that freedom is very important for the processes that generate a free society. And this is the kind of mistake that we sometimes make because we think that freedom of expression means that we should allow people to speak and we should allow them to seek information about what happens everywhere, transparency. But transparency, in a way, undermines freedom of opinion and expression. And it undermines the ability to use thought and expression in a way that may generate the necessary changes and adaptations that we may need in a very complex world. Political correctness and the identity politics, as well as the growing economic gaps, are very serious dangers to all liberal democracies. And we can see that, and in a way we can say, although this is going to be misleading, that part of the problem is that they don't put the social picture in a broad enough context, including on this question of the relationships between private and public. They don't give response to basic needs of people in a good balance, and they don't pay enough attention to the dangers of concentration of power by huge non-state agents 
the impact of globalization on anonymity and alienation. So anonymity helps a bit, but it doesn't help much. Putting the context in this way is misleading and dangerous. And what we want to do, and what we must do, is not rely on individuals. This is the task of leaders, intellectual, cultural, moral, political. The leaders should all the time give us a good, strong picture of a good life and the place of an individual meaningful existence within it. There are many variations to a good life and a good individual existence. Society must understand that there are many variations and allow them, and this is a point of strength for the individuals and the society. And we should be on the alert when we see processes that limit their background conditions, like privacy, that are necessary so that individuals can continue to be autonomous and independent and creative and courageous, and that our society and our decision-making mechanism will have the right balance of transparency and privacy. I mean, we all, or many of us, uh, sit a lot in appointments committees dealing with the very sensitive issues of promotions, and we know this tension between the need to say what we think is right and the uneasiness about saying what is right because it's not completely clear that this is not going to be leaked somehow. And I think this happens in appointments committee. Stakes are very low, but it may happen all over the place, and the stakes may be extremely high. So what should we do, and what do we have to do here? I think that we can talk about social engineering here, but we should do a few things. A, we should tell people that their vision of the protection that they get from anonymity is misleading, and wrong and dangerous. There are very serious costs to loss of privacy proper. 1984, the circle gave marvelous, powerful illustrations. Virginia Woolf in a room of one's own. Uh, it's less ominous, but is as powerful. So it is important. It's important to us, even if we are anonymous. But it must be there, not only for anonymous or relatively anonymous individuals. It must be there for all of us. Because all of us, including the people at the apex of power, need the ability to retire into somewhere where they are relaxed and confident are not afraid that their children or colleagues will leak something about them as everyone is in 1984. Because if they don't have those islands of liberty, their ability to do what it takes to have a good society and inclusive to many individuals is going to be severely, severely uh, 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 weakened. It's not only about individuals, although individuals need to practice control, discipline, and doing what is good in the time they have. It's not only about that. When we make decisions about policies, we need to be very aware all the time that we are making a specific decision, but the specific decision has an impact on a broader picture and the specific decision needs to take this broader picture into account. When we succeed in doing that, I think we have the beginning to think seriously about how we deal with the new challenge. And as I said, if we succeed in doing that, I think we can hope that people, uh, um, individuals and leaders, can have a secure enough understanding of what is at stake so we can combine will and knowledge and use law, technology, and science to 
to achieve the best protection we can have for this critical balance between the private and the public. Rudy, thank you very much for this brilliant lecture. And the floor is open for QA. This session is recorded. So if somebody asks a question, please state your name. Yeah. Privacy. <laughs> Privacy. <laughs> who deal with, uh, you know, resentment about uh, intrusive questionnaires, and sometimes they win in courts. And the employers are told that they cannot ask this question or that question, and then concepts of non-discrimination say that some questions are inadmissible because it's not relevant to employment, so if it's not relevant, you cannot ask it, and things like that. And these are important gains, but they are partial. I mean, not partial in the sense of partial, but they are not complete. And they, in effect, I think may lead our attention away from the more serious challenges. For instance, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most serious challenges is the fact that we are now living in a society in which every single individual is the agent of the most sophisticated and powerful machine for acquiring information, retaining information, disseminating information, and processing it. This is something that is, is new, and it also means that our control of our environment and our attention span is much more limited. Now, it's true that it's up to me. I don't need Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever. But when the President of the United States communicates via Twitter and all the media are now corresponding heatedly for a week about what he did about it and what he meant about this. Look, think about all the things we're not doing at the time that we are <coughs> having to consume the discussion about Mr. Trump's tweets. But you know, this is funny, but it's not. Because Mr. Trump won the election against many odds. And the fact that he won the election is built on some of the issues that I have now mentioned. The feeling of many people that they are not counted on by the political elites. The feeling that it's not clear that he will take care of them, but at least he gives them a voice. This is a private public issue. It denies them the legitimacy of seeking employment and membership because they're not members of the present intellectual economic hegemony. This is a serious problem about a healthy society. We need to attend to this problem if we want our society to be healthy. So it's important, but it's only Rudy. part. Trump is not yet a dictator, but isn't that true about all dictators that they gave a voice to the people and that's why they followed him? Again. <laughs> Come again. And what, what I wanted to ask you is, Trump is not a dictator yet, but isn't it true that all dictators in the past gave a sense of a, a voice to the people and that's why they followed them? Yes. Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, yes. and so on. I think, you know, it, it, it's extremely interesting. I mean, there is a debate now in constitutional, comparative constitutional law about the question, 
can it be that, <coughs> again, after Hitler, can it be that a ruler who is really a dictator gets to power via democratic elections and how? Now, this is a serious, a very serious question. Maybe we hope we will not have to face it again, but clearly we do, and I think that no. The, social, the, the, the civil society in the United States is still sufficiently varied, strong, open, although it's struggling with many issues. I think that it's fascinating to see what they do, and, and I think it's clearly the, 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 the jury is still out on, on Mr. Trump. So, so we will have to wait. But populism is very important. Because populism, in a way, is what some elites are saying is terrible about our contemporary democracy. But populism is the idea that we give them the vote. Now, democracy is a complicated idea. And I think some of the debate about democracy is precisely the debate that Popper was talking about, about is democracy what the people in fact want, despite the fact they're not all intelligent, enlightened, and so Or is democracy what the king philosopher says? Now, I think the answer is it's some, something in between. But the something in between is complex, and finding the something in between is similar in principle to trying to find the balance between private and public between what individuals want and what the group needs. We have time for one more question. <coughs> Please. You, you Please state your name. My, I'm sorry, my name is Matt Schein. My background is software development at IBM for many, many years in America, not in Israel. Uh, you mentioned many factors, but the, the elephant in the room that you didn't mention is economic advantage, profit making, etc. Facebook and Google make money by targeting advertising. In order to target advertisements, they have to know about you. Okay? When I grew up, the default was everything was private unless the person wanted to make it public. When Facebook came along, it changed. Everything was public unless you told somehow that it was kept it private. So we're dealing with tremendously motivated, successful companies that make a fortune, literally, out of, I own stock in them, <laughs> make a fortune out of targeting advertisements based on knowing about individuals. And it's, it's getting worse. They know where you are now. Other companies know where you are, and so forth. Well, I, you're right. I, I have a much longer paper, and I, I, I thought I couldn't really <laughs> you know, uh, give the whole of it. And you're quite right that part of the reason that so many people are not concerned about their privacy is their helplessness. Because they know that it's not only states anymore. It's not just Big Brother. It's actually the fact that these companies may be stronger than states, in many states. And the incentives for violations of privacy are enormous. So people are helpless. They say, well, it's here to stay. If you can't beat them, join them, let's at least get what we can out of it. But it's very interesting because these giants have conflicts of interest. They, on the one hand, want to have a lot of information, but they also need to have this information exclusive so they can sell it and use it exclusively. So the technology and the incentives work in both ways. So if we are smart enough, this is what I hinted at. If we are smart enough, we can enlist the economic as well as the political incentives in both directions. It takes a lot of creativity and leadership, but to do that, we must at least have a very clear picture of what is at stake. We cannot just continue to say there is a general right to know irrespective of the price that we are paying in terms of the islands of privacy that we are undermining by forcing people to divulge what was told them in a private meeting. This is something that we just don't care about. It's all over the place, and we lawyers are responsible for that. We, when we want to impose responsibility, 
we don't pay any attention to the necessary internal structures that do indeed want to hide. They do indeed want to shield. But they want to shield in part because they are afraid that there will be overproportional responsibility and they need to maintain the integrity of their processes and sometimes courts and NGOs and liberals and investigative journalists either don't care or don't see that their gain in forcing disclosure might well be something that has far-reaching systemic repercussions that are not going to be very good to this shared ideal of a free and flourishing society. Thank you. There will be an opportunity for more questions at the end. Thank you again. <laughs>